you think about Monet as a painter of very strong color. First of all, he added white to everything. That knocks the color down, makes it chalky. Then he mixed two or three colors together, that dropped it down in e even lower intensity. So what, when you see his paintings, what strikes you as being strong color is the relationship of the underpainting making the overpainting roar and the delicate relationship of the two. So if I come in here, remember, this is more intense. If I bring that into this, see, it belongs. They are the same. But what I've just done is, what's the, the cook on TV when he... Bam. Bam. OK, I did bam, all right? <laughs> but you see? How, how, how beautifully this increases, and then bam. <laughs> Do you see it? Do you see how it works? It's, I'm in that zone. I'm on a line from high intensity to neutral. I can bring this down even lower, but the transitions are going to be so smooth so delicate, it's not going to be interrupted. I won't violate the integrity of red violet. Boy, that's good news, that's authority. Hey, <laughs> you didn't know I could do that, did you? <laughs> so, this is what I have. And he says what I'm going to give you is red orange and blue green. Now what's that do? Instantly it gives you more strength here, it gives you more strength there, and you now have seven colors and a triad. You will mix everything you need from this inner triad. And when you need something a little stronger in the direction of yellow, having mixed yellow up with orange and green, you'll add a little to here, and bring it up to here. If you want to diminish the intensity of this, good. You add some neutral to it, and it'll bring it into this field. If you want it to be more yellow-green, and this isn't strong enough, you can mix these two together and mix that, and you'll get something that'll move up higher. That has great staining power. It's a glazing color. This is a dead color, meaning it isn't a glazing color. It isn't transparent, it's opaque. And if I add a little bit of white to this, it immediately gets chalky. Hmm? I add the tiniest bit of white to that, it still is extremely powerful. So we're going to have this term. The phthalo color has great staining power. So, with these low intensity colors, you have colors that would be suitable for these transitions. See how nicely all of this goes together? And if you come in and you've got a red orange here and you add a little bit of white to it because this is what Monet would do, See, it's a very low intensity red orange. It's going to be a cool painting moving warmer as it turns to the right. It's going to be a, a dark painting moving lighter as it turns to the right. These are transitions that you can employ and I'll try to discuss some of them with the slides. I show you this, it's Gauguin. It's a still life, very raw. Sometimes I, I like his color. I certainly don't here, but I'm bringing it to your attention because I want you to notice how where he has greens, he turns the background into red-orange. Red-orange being the split complement of green and red-violet, which is the split complement of yellow-green. When he comes up against yellows, he goes to a more violet, red-violet. As he comes in, uh, against the yellows, this too should be more violet, and he comes up against the green, and he gets 
closer to red. Do you see the game he's playing? We've succeeded now in creating this contrast at this point, that's all I want. And if I want this to come forward, I can accent, accent this by a light halo right there. See, what it, see how quickly that throws it forward? And because I'm cheating, while I'm at it, I might come in with a dark halo at this point to really force it to jump. This is edge painting. All right, it's very muted. You don't have any value change here that gives you uh, a separation between this interior rectangle and the border. That's not very good because part of what it is you should be doing is matching values. And if you can't develop a keen sense of value, you can't paint. She has a friend come and sit for a portrait. The color is richer, more intense, but not raw. <laughs> she does this beautifully. Doesn't she have a good time? The arabesque is subtle. If somebody hadn't brought your attention to it, you wouldn't have noticed it. Once you do see it, you have to smile. It's just a secret she shares with you. Hmm? And she's building this with these diagonals, isn't she? She's running them all the way through. Really very good. To mix to here, I take the blue, violet, and four as a mix. I take a dead neutral. I take this and I start mixing this way. And I'm mixing this in and mixing more and mixing more in and mixing more in until I get here and I have enough th this mix so I can start mixing with this color and I can start mixing this one with that to get across. I can mix this with this to that and this to this and this to a point down here and mix it over. Let's see what happens if we introduce yellows into this scheme because the light is yellow. Well, it's a whole new ball game, isn't it? We've got some red oranges down here. We've got some red violets in here. This is very violet and red violet, is it not? Incredibly so. The halo outside of the docks is very much lighter yellow orange. Coming up here, where this goes warm, that is now a neutral violet. It's going from light to dark. Do you see it? Hmm? It's going from warm to cool. Now remember, if it's less intense than a warm, then it's cooler. We've got to reach a point where you're sitting looking at something you're painting and you can nail it. They are not arbitrary in their choice of color, but rather through contemplation, reinforced with a technical understanding of the principles of color theory, they can think through the problem and decide how they're going to refine what they see and then believe they see it and everything is going to be modified by the temperature and strength of the light falling on the colors that have been brought together. This is a young student on his own. He'd left the studios. He's giving you the design of a still life. Then he's doing a relatively direct value study, but if you look carefully, every object has been greatly distorted, twisted. The center line shifts. The forms turn and twist. Then he turns it into a pure abstraction, flattens everything out. Hmm? And then he continues with the same objects now in a chevron, an elliptical chevron. Here's a student, I believe it was Sid McGinley, 
who's showing you a whole series of planes in perspective and they're transparent and they're overlapping. Now that's fun. Remember, we are not painting what we see. We are painting what we've learned will work and read for the layman as our subject. We know that we, through trickery, have to contrive to make it look volumetric, even if it's on a two, even since it's on a two-dimensional surface. So we've got to exaggerate. We've got to uh, emphasize that which will help to make that look volumetric, and edit out anything that's going to flatten it out. And we want it to be warm in the light and cool in the shadow with a warm reflected light. Well, if the shadow's cool, a neutral in the shadow area will look warm because of simultaneous contrast. I beg you to make certain that you've set up your still life so that the colored papers you use or the paint you use in painting the environment are drawn immediately from your color wheel. Hmm? Immediately. So if you're painting something that's predominantly in the light warm, sure, go ahead. A blue violet and a green, a blue violet ground plane because it's warm. The coolest point is blue green. So blue violet is closer to red orange than is green. Do you see it? So you make this on the ground plane so it comes forward. And that's what you've done. You put the warmest here, but it's much too intense. And if you corrected the core here, you redrew that gas shadow so that it fell down here and wasn't so... See, it shouldn't be way up there and it shouldn't give you that little gutter between the okay. shadow and the yep. background. If you repaint that, mm -hmm. you move this core so it's fuller and a more accurate ellipse okay. and it's in, further into the third. You blend out this dark halo, which is drawing attention to itself because it's light on either side of it, mm -hmm. making so it a dark blending. figure, blend it out so that it, it's dark only up against this edge and immediately becomes lighter and then finally darker for the vignette.